Okay, I have nine on the nose. Let's go ahead and get started. First of all, happy Global Entrepreneurship Week, everybody. It's a great week, and we're so happy that you are joining us for today's webinar. Uh, we're going to be covering uh, different funding avenues for building entrepreneurial ecosystems. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping items before we jump in. First of all, I do ask that during the uh, main portions of the presentation today, you do mute yourself. That does not preclude you, and, and I wish that you would participate inside of the chat feature, which many of you have discovered. Uh, you can go ahead and share with us your website address and where you're joining us from today. Enter in any questions or concerns or technical issues you may have during this presentation there as well. We will provide a PDF of the PowerPoint. We are recording this and we'll follow up with everyone following today's presentation. Since all of you registered, we'll make sure to send you, like I said, the recording link and then also a PDF of the PowerPoint as we've got some really cool resources that I'll cover here in a little bit. Introductions. Um, I am Rob Williams. I serve as director of SourceLink. I've been in this role for about six years. Prior to joining SourceLink, uh, I was at Iowa SourceLink. In my role, I do a lot of work with our current affiliate network, helping them to uh, not only launch and uh, begin their implementations of SourceLink, but then also we regularly connect with our affiliate members and I work with them on things like developing KPIs and measures and outcomes associated with their implementation. Oftentimes, those outcomes and KPIs and measures result in additional funding or help to secure their current funding streams. And so this is obviously a topic near and dear to my heart. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Dara to introduce herself. Good morning, everybody. I'm Dara Macon, and I uh, serve as director of our business development and strategic partnerships uh, across the country. I've been with SourceLink for almost five years now. And prior to that, I had the opportunity to work with a lot of economic development chamber uh, entities in the Midwest and bring those relationships and understanding of the challenges uh, and opportunities that folks in our world are facing. And I also have the uh, honor and pleasure of being able to work with many communities leading up to the opportunity for us to formally engage with them. And um, so I'm excited to be on this webinar today. So Rob, you gonna share a little bit about SourceLink? Yep. I had a little delay in my computer there. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so I just want to share a little bit about SourceLink, a little bit about our organization and background. Uh, we have a, a national footprint that encompasses Sacramento all the way down to San Juan. We are an affiliated network of groups and economic developers. A lot of us uh, would be self-described as ecosystem builders, helping to improve the infrastructure and environment to support and grow entrepreneurs. At SourceLink, we, we kind of have a process that we deploy when we're working with communities. It starts with identification of resources. It then moves on to better connecting those resources to entrepreneurs and to one another. We empower the communities that we engage with to be able to identify and uh, collaboratively fill gaps in a community to help the entrepreneurial environment. And then of course, we do all of this so that we can actually know when we move the needle and we have advanced tools and processes that help us measure our economic impact something that's critically important, especially when we're talking about today's topic around funding. Uh, we've worked with all different kinds of agencies. We've worked in rural and urban, um, and that's just a little bit about our background and who we are here at SourceLink. So Rob, maybe we could uh, quickly poll and see where folks are uh, joining us from as far as their organization affinity. Sounds good. If everybody could take a second and just uh, indicate which organization you uh, most closely align with. I said there's literally a place called Papa John Entrepreneurial Center. And yeah. I'm thinking it's Papa John's Pizza. Oh, well, yes, that's true. And actually, that's Tim Putnam, who I was hoping that was the Tim that I was. Papa John Center. 
All right. Um, it looks like we have most everybody. Uh, we'll give it just another couple of seconds if you still want to participate. We're seeing a e pretty even uh, representation. It looks like we do have uh, quite a few uh, entrepreneur support organizations and um, I'm recognizing many of the names from our affiliated network, which is great. All right. Get to the point, Dara. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, everybody. Um, we have uh, tailored this presentation today, so hopefully we're going to hit on some things that are going to resonate with everyone in attendance. And so we'll stop the poll now. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about today's agenda. Um, what we want to cover is really the how, the why, and the who. Uh, we want to talk a little bit about the case for entrepreneurial ecosystem building, things to think about when you're approaching funders. We want to talk a little bit about who is actually you know, the people in the organizations that are actually funding this kind of work right now. Um, and we even have um, a special guest joining us to talk about how he was able to go after and procure lots of funding for their ecosystem building efforts. So we're very excited to go ahead and jump right on in. So let's start a little bit with the why, and I'm not gonna belabor this too long as I know many of you, and I recognize many of you, we've been doing this a long time. We understand the impact of new and young firms. Um, right now, particularly with COVID, we know that almost 25% of small businesses have closed, some temporarily, others permanently. Especially hard hit have been um, your main street businesses, your restaurants, retail. And we also know that in particular entrepreneurs of color um, are facing um, a harder path to recovery right now. There are estimates that as many as 60% of the, the disclosures may become permanent. Um, and unfortunately, small, business, uh, small businesses have not been a key focus for policymakers. And so we were been really unprepared for this pandemic. As a result, we're seeing many local communities that are finding ways to step up and to support their entrepreneurs and small business owners, which is very inspiring. It also means that right now we're in a great time for you to be thinking about how you can be a catalyst for positive change in your community and supporting entrepreneurs. And we are seeing a, a shift really truly to this grow your own and entrepreneurship pathways. And so that's very exciting. We're seeing that nationally, we're seeing that hyper locally and it fits perfectly for why this is so important and why we're having this conversation as part of Global Entrepreneurship Week right now. All right, so um, let's get into a little bit about some of the, the how this work is being done and just some current trends. Um, many of you on the webinar uh, know that there's been a significant emphasis and lots of conversations around diversity and inclusion the last couple of years, which has been really amplified uh, with all of the challenges that we're facing in 2020. So we're seeing things around uh, a focus on venture capital for uh, underrepresented entrepreneurs. And we're also seeing uh, more interest uh, at the not only national, but regional and local efforts of investing in under-resourced uh, groups across the country. Uh, we're also seeing uh, an increase in conversations around rural development and initiatives related to access to broadband in particular. And it's been uh, very painful, uh, not only in urban and metropolitan areas, but also in our rural areas uh, with the challenges associated with access to good broadband. It affects the ability for entrepreneurs to decide to live in rural communities and be able to run their businesses. It also affects uh, things related to telehealth and a, a whole number of uh, community related challenges. So uh, there is a lot of emphasis and also funding out there right now at both the federal uh, level around broadband, but also we're seeing uh, many communities step up 
and not wait uh, on some of those policies and things that could be hindering access. And they're looking at public-private partnerships and other unique ways uh, to work around the challenges. We also um, have seen uh, trends with CDFI supporting uh, not only for-profit but nonprofit organizations, uh, providing loans that are specifically targeted towards disadvantaged groups and markets. And then we have uh, things like the Federal Reserve um, who uh, have programs that provide match capital for nonprofit and community development organizations that are trying to boost investments in low to moderate income communities. We have a really interesting example, one of our affiliated uh, clients, Network Kansas, who's been able to successfully tap into uh, funding that's available at the state level to create matching loan programs for startups and businesses. And the thing that's interesting about this is they are certifying communities and allowing those local communities to really make decisions about how they want to invest uh, in the businesses that, that they're closest to and most familiar with. So we have a special guest with us today. Um, I would like to invite um, Dr. Lomax Campbell uh, to share a little bit about his, his story. We've had the pleasure of getting to know Dr. Lomax Campbell and also uh, his core leadership team. Uh, we recently um, are happy to announce that they have launched Nexus I-90. And uh, we thought it would be great for you to hear directly from Dr. Campbell on the importance of collaborations and um, how he has been able to effectively secure funding from a variety of sources. So uh, welcome, Dr. Campbell. Good morning, Dara, and thank you, um, Dara, Rob, and Pola for, for inviting me to join you all today for this fantastic conversation. Um, as many of you know, it's not easy to find funding for this work because it's, it's been historically on the fringes um, of society around economic development practice and, and how communities build wealth for their residents. Um, here's a little bit about my background. Um, I'm a serial entrepreneur who's worked in uh, multiple sectors, including higher education and now um, municipal government. Um, under the mayor's office, I lead the Office of Community Wealth Building. And here's just a snapshot of my education. I won't run it down, um, but just wanted to make it available for context. We can go to the next slide. So um, for those of you who may not know me, um, I, I see a number of familiar faces from eShip and some other spaces that we've been in together. Um, I try to think holistically um, when, when doing things. And so going back, uh, when I first started um, at, with the city of Rochester, I was told, you know, the, char the first charge of our office was to build an entrepreneurial ecosystem. And I'm like, what is that? You know, um, of course, you know, having taken classes in marine biology and things of that nature in high school and college, I understood what ecosystems were. I just did not understand what entrepreneurial ecosystem um, building was or, or what it looked like. Um, just because it was a relatively novel concept. And so over the last two years, we, we've begun to articulate this plan um, as we better understood what community wealth building was. We said, okay, let's build a comprehensive community-based economic development action plan where we first built the system of supports for entrepreneurs. And then we began to develop standardized kind of um, assessments that may vary by sector or by type of activity to determine the effectiveness of any given service provider within that ecosystem. And then how can we initiate activities to actually enhance that ecosystem, understanding that all ESOs or resource partners are not created equal. And then through that, understanding what gaps exist in the service provision, can we then encourage and support the development of new programs for small businesses? And so that's what you see here in this model, um, uh, projects A through D. This has been kind of our master plan for a three-year period, three to five-year period on how we want to do um, this work. And so having this comprehensive view of what we're trying to accomplish and why was motivating for many of our funders 
to understand what they were supporting and why they were supporting it. The other thing is we wanted to do this in a phased process approach, um, understanding that having a small but mighty team with a small operating budget, we would have to raise our own resources to do this work. And then the other thing is you can't bite off more than you can chew. And so our initial thought was um, phase one was really um, a long tail of pre-launch activities and then leading into ultimately launching um, Nexus I-90 in August of this year. So let's say September 2018, we began with a kickoff convening with one of our funders, Living Cities, um, who provided us funding. You'll see that in, in, in an upcoming slide where we used that funding for all of our pre-launch activities. It was about $100,000, and we were a part of their cohort five of their City Accelerator Initiative. And some of our pre-launch activities included four focus groups um, with different niche populations of entrepreneurs. So we, we held a focus group with um, Black business owners, Latino business owners, women-owned businesses, and businesses that grossed over $100,000 in revenue or had some dealing with the city um, in the past, whether it was to get permitting and zoning or contracting opportunities or any of those types of things, receive loans or grants in the past. The other thing we did with the pre-launch activities were we, we conducted a survey to really understand what small businesses cared about, what their challenges were, what their aspirations were, what their constraints were, um, and, and, and how might the city and other partners benefit them and helping them achieve their stated goals and, and maybe even clarify some of their unstated needs. We were also able to take a look at municipal code and realized we didn't need to invest in um, uh, changing the code. It was more about enforcing the code to make sure that our work was equitable and inclusive. And so we ended up funding some undoing racism workshops for about 85 um, participants to begin, begin to embed that racial equity lens into our work. So that all kind of, um, predates uh, or, or pre precedes the, the actual launch of Nexus I-90. And then Dara was um, able to help me understand the importance of eShip because I didn't never heard of it. And so we came to eShip and learned more about what this was. We then later began a 28-week implementation process with the team here from SourceLink. And that allowed us to actually um, begin garnering um, kind of momentum around getting folks listed on our platform and building excitement and energy. The other phases would dovetail this work just further in refining and enhancing um, uh, the ecosystem that we're building. So Walt Garden development is really around um, taking the CRM system, SourceLink Pro, and making it more collaborative where every organization that support entrepreneurs within our community are able to actually use one shared CRM system. And that's the deepen collaboration and, and utilization of the platforms. So that's where you see phase two and three kind of coming in. The enhancement program was designed to take a cluster of ESOs from our community. Um, we've selected six actually, and give them both technical assistance and capital resources to actually improve their services over a two year period. And all the while building relationships with the cities of Syracuse and Buffalo to see, can we align our activities um, around community-based economic development. And, and here on the slide, you see some of the things that we're all doing in common, like the Race Equity and Leadership Initiative is the real initiative, and it exists in Buffalo, uh, Rochester and Syracuse. Or the Entrepreneurial Ecosystem Solutions exist in Buffalo and Rochester, and so on and so forth. And then lastly, phase five has really been iterative, but trying to identify opportunities to close the gaps. Let's go to the next slide. So here's the continuum of uh, support that we've received for this work. Um, that plan wasn't in fully intact in September 2018. It was emergent. You know, if you read any of Michael Porter's work um, around strategy, he'll talk about emergent strategy. Um, if, if you want, if anybody's interested in the scholastic side of things. But in essence, we received that initial funding from Living Cities, and it allowed us to do feasibility and pre-launch. And we were able to leverage those funds to go to J.P. Morgan Chase and say, this is what we're doing. It's novel. It's never been done in our area. And so the ability to leverage existing resources um, help them understand the importance of uh, help us do, which is close the gap, to be able to actually bring this thing to fruition. And so they invested another 137500 into the project, um, which would allow us to subscribe to SourceLink for a three-year period which was huge for us. 
Um, concurrently, um, my colleagues um, in the Office of Innovation at the time in Neighborhood and Business Development were working with my team to try to start a revolving loan fund called the Revitalized Rochester Fund, which would garner the interest from about seven banks agreeing to put three and a half million dollars into a pot for a revolving loan fund um, managed by the Rochester Economic Development Corporation. And that would be later matched by $10 million in grants from the New York State um, um, Upstate Revitalization Initiative. And so out of that $10 million from the state, uh, $1.5 million was granted to support um, the enhancement or building of entrepreneurial ecosystem um, activities. And so I conceptualized this cohort program that would facilitate peer learning and capacity building and give technical assistance to the organizations who work with entrepreneurs, as opposed to doing a series of, you know, special kinds of loans and grants for the entrepreneurs themselves. Um, we figured that that would have a bigger impact and they're going to work over a 24 month period. And so we received um, that award back in 2000, uh, 2019, December. Uh, the announcement anyways, to support this initiative. And just this past September, we were invited into Living Cities Closing the Gaps Network as a result of the relationship that we had already established with them through the City Accelerator Program and our contributions to that. That would allow us to center food entrepreneurs or food-based entrepreneurs in trying to make um, uh, growing assets and other infrastructural supports available to them and making sure they're leveraging SourceLink or Nexus I-90 in our context. To, to achieve their needs. And finally, because we were doing the launch of Nexus I-90 and keeping our relationship live with JP Morgan, we were able to tell them that our next big thing would be to deepen our collaboration. And tomorrow publicly, actually in Rochester, you'll, you'll hear um, if you're tuned into our public um, program about this additional grant that we're receiving to expand the CRM system. So you all are getting it first. And so, as you can see, these are relationships formed over time, staying focused on a common direction. And that's very important, as well as um, we have over 15 different organizations collaborating with us. So to show systemsness, which is a term we sometimes use here in New York State, is an important and appealing thing to, to funders because they're trying to achieve the biggest impact for their benefactors' investment. So that's all I got. Um, I believe there's an, a, a second poll when we turn it over to the next slide. So Rob, the floor is yours. Yeah, I think, oh, here we go. So uh, before we uh, move into the next part of the conversation, we wanted to get a sense from you on what type of funding that you have experience working with. All right, we have a nice mix of foundation and private, private sector dollars. That's great. A little bit of experience with uh, the government grant process. And then I, uh, if you don't mind, those of you that are selecting other, if you could drop something into the chat. Hey, hey can you hear me? That would be, uh, tell us a little bit more about um, additional resources that you're tapping into, that would be wonderful. All right, so we have kind of even um, split between foundation and private sector dollars. Let's, so let's go ahead and close the poll. Thank you, Paula. All right, so um, most of you um, on the webinar uh, are working in ecosystem built the ecosystem building realm. But um, for those that may be with government uh, entities or economic development, you might be more familiar with the term that we are using it, um, to refer to ecosystem as also interchangeable with uh, infrastructure. So think of this as the support mechanisms that are in your, your community 
that can support the work that you're doing around entrepreneurs and small businesses. So just like in traditional economic development, where you have um, an infrastructure that ranges from uh, funding to commercial real estate, uh, all of the things that are, are part of that. We also find that when we're working in building out a, a uh, platform or a way for the community to connect together uh, to create an ecosystem of support. And so we have kind of uh, taken a visualization here to give you an idea of what some of those typical uh, groups that uh, participate in ecosystem building might look like. So you have your educational institutions and their programming and offerings. You have your community-based organizations and your economic development entities. You also uh, will have your local governments and we're seeing a lot more activity uh, from mayors and uh, from the public sector, uh, especially uh, over the last year or two. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. And then we have also, um, our, of course, the group that many of you are part of on this call today, and that is your, your ESOs or your entrepreneur support organizations. Each one of these groups play an important role in building out a healthy environment for your entrepreneurs and small businesses to succeed. And also they have, each one of these groups have different connections and also this different ways of tapping into funding sources that we're gonna talk about here in a minute. Um, but first I um, wanna give you some examples uh, that, of different uh, organizations in this case, uh, foundations that are su supporting this type of work. So uh, we have foundations that are providing direct grants, or they may be uh, providing talent and expertise in their communities, and in some cases, programming. So I know we have our, uh, some friends from uh, Kaufman on the webinar today, and um, they will, you know, you may be familiar with some of their programs like uh, One Million Cups or the Fast Track program. They've also uh, been hosting the eShip Summit for the last four years, but they're um, really uh, looking at uh, a broad range of not only funding, but programming to help in the work that we do. Um, most recently, uh, if you've not heard, they've also announced uh, a new grant application called Grant Central Standards. And this is an opportunity, it's primarily focused on the uh, four states here in the Midwest, we call them the Heartland states of Missouri, Iowa, Nebraska, and Kansas. However, they are encouraging collaborations between two or more organizations, and there's an opportunity for uh, those of you that are in one of those four states to also work closely and collaborate with uh, opportunities and organizations that may exist outside of the four states. So this is a, a really uh, exciting opportunity. The first phase for that uh, is closing on December 3rd, but then they will also be opening it back up in the spring for those of you that need a little more time to think about uh, what programs or resources that you might be able to bring to the party. Uh, another great example um, is the, the Lilly Endowment Organization Foundation. They are, have provided funding to three community foundations up in the Northwest Indiana area. Three, those three community foundations came together with a interest in improving the environment for underdeveloped um, entrepreneurs and thinking about this ecosystem systems approach to what they could do in the region. And they recently launched the initiative is called Northwest Biz Hub, if you wanna check them out. Um, also, we have an example out in uh, California uh, the James Irvine Foundation provided funding to a membership-based organization called the Microenterprise Collaborative. 
they're focused on connect connectivity and also thinking about the visibility of resources that specifically support micro enterprise businesses in the inland Southern California region. And um, they also were able to launch a the resource navigator, which is an online search database that organizes the resources and makes it easy for entrepreneurs to connect to the right fit. They also wanted to embark on a report though to think about the quality of the jobs that those micro enterprise businesses are creating. And that was all because they were able to leverage their relationship with the James Irvine Foundation. Uh, recently, um, there has been some exciting work going on um, in North Carolina. Uh, the, our friends at the Thomas Entrepreneurship Hub in Pembroke recently launched uh, SCENE, which is uh, an acronym for the Sandhills Entrepreneur Engagement Network. And they are using funds to do their work in a nine county, very distressed region uh, that have been provided through the Golden Leaf Foundation and also um, some EDA uh, grant money that they were able to secure. And then um, another great example too, we see JP Morgan Chase involved in um, a lot, lot of projects, everything from a simple first step of asset mapping and just really understanding what resources exist in, the, in a community to support small business and entrepreneurs, all the way to programs like Advancing Black Pathways. Um, also, uh, we are uh, fortunate to be involved in a project with NBIA and Fluent that's being funded by JP Morgan Chase that's looking at how do you measure accelerator cohort impact. And that's a really exciting uh, program that's underway. Then another example of a foundation that isn't directly providing funding, but offers programming is uh, the Edward Lowe Foundation. And some of you are very familiar with Edward Lowe. Uh, they are known for their second stage business program called Economic Gardening, and which is available in a number of regions and states across the country. But uh, this is an opportunity not just to focus on startup activity, but also to think about those businesses that may be in your community that are interested in expanding, finding new markets and growing. And uh, that is a great program uh, to help in, in that process. So um, a little bit now about some of the federal government dollars that are out there. And I realize we're covering a lot. We could do a, a, have a separate conversation on any one of these segments or types of funding. So our, our goal here is to give you some examples um, and make sure that you are aware of some of the dollars that may be available. Um, the, we have things coming out of the federal government right now. We're all familiar with uh, the variety of CARES funding that's available. Um, we are, uh, would like to talk briefly or showcase um, some work that's going on in Chattanooga. Uh, the, the Chattanooga Chamber and a couple other organizations are collaborating to leverage some pass-through funding uh, CARES funding that came through to the state of, of Tennessee and um, is being administered via United Way. So if you've not, if you're not having conversations or not familiar with the work that your United Way, if you have one uh, in your community is doing, uh, there may be an opportunity there uh, to explore uh, the, the role that United Way is playing. Also, we have um, a things like the 2020 Sprint Challenge that the EDA just announced recently. There's over, there's $2,500 million available specifically to address economic, health, safety issues uh, that are a direct result of the, the coronavirus with an, a lens around entrepreneurship and innovation. That application process is coming up pretty quickly. Uh, so if you haven't looked into it, uh, just know that 
the deadline for submission is, is December 3rd for that particular uh, grant. Also, we have um, every other year, what's a known, used to be known as the I-6 challenge. The EDA has renamed it to Regional Innovation Strategies. These are funds that are available to help build regional economies uh, with a, a focus on scalable startups. The applications are closed this year, but, but keep your eye out because historically the government has refunded that program. Um, a great example of leveraging the things that Dr. Campbell was talking about earlier, collaboration and understanding a gap or a need in your community can really lead to um, the creation of programming to help address uh, those, those type of opportunities. In Kansas City, um, the Digital Sandbox KC program is an example of a previous recipient, two-time recipient, as a matter of fact, of, of I-6 funding. They identified uh, a need in Kansas City for seed funding and were able through those relationships with multiple organizations to, to launch that program, which continues on today. They were able, uh, because of the success of the programming, uh, to continue to get support from, from local uh, organizations and private sector for that program. And then if you happen to have uh, a university that is eligible for the EDA uh, University Center uh, grant, that is an, also an opportunity um, if, for you to think about ways that you might uh, develop relationships or look for ways to um, amplify the work that you're doing and, and uh, support what the university is doing in your, your region. And then um, also, uh, don't forget about your USDA and your rural development opportunities. Um, right now, there are funds available for supporting socially disadvantaged groups, uh, rural business development grants uh, focused on technical assistance and training for small and emerging businesses. And then also there uh, is uh, quite a bit of funding available out there for rural broadband investment. And we know that that is so critical for a variety of things, everything from telehealth to education, but also if you are in a, a rural community, how can you attract entrepreneurs who may be interested in living in your community, but need that broadband access uh, to be able to conduct their business online? Then um, we also um, wanted to take a quick look at a couple of examples of associations and uh, some, some private sector relationships. Um, Dr. Campbell had mentioned earlier the Nash um, or Living Cities, and uh, they are supporting a, a number of communities across the country, including Rochester, Baltimore, New Orleans, Albuquerque, and all of those communities are focused on tackling entrepreneur barriers for people of color. And then we have programs like the National League of Cities uh, in collaboration and funding support from the Kauffman Foundation. Uh, they have a different cohort groups that are working on a variety of challenges and opportunities in their, their cities. Um, and we have an example, we were able to work with the um, mayor and the city of East Hampton. Um, the mayor had a vision, she's uh, the Blueprint East Hampton and entrepreneurship is a component of that Blueprint uh, East Hampton initiative. We were able to help them uh, understand what assets that they had not only in their community, but regionally, and then be able to organize that information and make it available to their small business owners. And so I encourage you uh, to take a look at uh, Blueprint East Hampton if you have an opportunity. So um, that was a real quick high level overview of government 
foundation and uh, other opportunities that uh, you may be able to leverage or take a look at to support the work that you're doing, the important work that you're doing in your communities. And uh, Rob's got some tips for us. Thanks, Dara, that was great. I think those examples help highlight how you can go and approach um, and who to approach for potential funding opportunities. I am so excited to share some of my super secret tips, which aren't so secret anymore because I'm going to share them with all of you. First tip, um, you need to start building relationships now with funders. Um, do not wait. And I have a number of, of friends that are in foundations uh, stretching from Michigan to, uh, to Missouri, and, and even I see a couple of familiar uh, names on the chat here, it's so important to start building those relationships with potential funders and to start having those conversations. And I will tell you, far too often, the brightest, the smartest people that I know in this field are inside of foundations, and they're only ever approached with requests for funding which is a huge mistake because like I said, these are some of the smartest folks I know work in foundations. You can always ask for advice for their feedback um, to lend, uh, ask for their knowledge about different topic areas. Just start that conversation. Um, and so you, it's never too early to start building those relationships with potential funders. And, and even if they're not gonna be a, a funder, they will definitely become a champion of, of your, your project and the work that you are doing. The second item is, um, you know, everything has to happen with collaboration and matches everything as well, especially when it comes to the federal government. If you can go out and find even a, a couple of, of agencies to, to put up time or money and even just a small amount, and you can start making those small amounts um, start to make an impact when you put them together and then go after federal, federal dollars. It makes it very easy and, and hard to say no when you come to EDA or SBA or to a foundation, you say, I have five partners, they're all contributing $5,000, we're ready to match. Um, and so that, that piece is really important. The other piece is that um, when you're able to, to get those partners together and you do it collaboratively, we have seen time and time again, it is way more likely to succeed, it is way more likely to be sustainable and sticky, um, and it's way more likely to have greater impact. Um, so if you're thinking about doing this ecosystem building work or this entrepreneurship support building work, go find a couple of partners and pull something together. The third tip that I have is really around the problem and being extremely clear and articulating what the problem is. For those of you who are our SourceLink affiliates, I see a number of you, you know the very first call, the very first call that I have when we start our engagement is, what does success look like? What are we trying to change? What are gonna be the measures that we're gonna put in place now? What are gonna be those KPIs? And how are we gonna be able to articulate that back to our funders, back to your stakeholders to show that we have moved the needle? Far too often organizations say, well, it'd be really easy and I really just wanna make resources visible. Okay, let's get to the underlying issue and let's start to build a business plan around that. Um, the groups that are able to articulate that clear problem and how they will solve it, get funding. The last piece is tied to that, and that's around measurement and knowing when you're able to move that needle. Um, if you don't have technologies and systems and processes in place to be able to track your impact, you will not be sustainable and you will not be able to go uh, request add-on or sustainable, uh, sustainable funding. Uh, measurement is everything. Um, and so if nothing else, make sure that you think through how you're going to be able to report your impact and um, there's also an element of storytelling here, which I think gets sometimes lost. But um, you know, that's, that's so, so, so very, very critical. And that measurement piece is something to be thinking about now before you're asked. All right, here's my super, super secret. <laughs> there are uh, a couple of links that I'm including here that you can go and be able to research and find available funding pools uh, with. Grants.gov is your government grant search. It's about everything that you would kind of expect from a government grant search. It's a little bit hard to, to filter through, but a lot of different opportunities are there. Um, there's a great article that we wrote about which foundations are funding entrepreneurship. A lot of it is what we covered and what Dara shared earlier. Um, but if you wanna digest that and read through it and see links to all of those resources, you can do that here. 
Here's one of my favorites, the foundation directory online. Uh, this is a great uh, way to find foundations, even in your own backyard. Right now, community foundations are investing in this work, folks. Um, and so you can go and find those community foundations using this tool. Um, and using also there's a community foundation locator that's a specific one. Um, and then we also have an article that we wrote, wrote for uh, the International Economic Development Council um, in, the inter, in their International Economic Development Journal um, about making and measuring an entrepreneurial ecosystem and how you can put into place early measures, emerging measures, and advanced measures. And it's not always all about jobs and investments. It can be, but it doesn't have to be. And we're seeing a, a, ready, a, a willingness and, and, and more responsive to these uh, different approaches around, can we start to measure collaboration and, and can we start to count that as something that we can go after funding for? And the answer is absolutely yes. But you need to understand uh, what that looks like and, and try to build some measures around it. And we have some guidance in that article around that. And we are right on time, Dara. And Lomax, look at that. <laughs> 15 minutes, spot on. So at yeah. this point, um, you know, we're happy to take any questions, uh, any of your thoughts. Uh, I don't mind if you want to unmute. That's totally fine. If you want to turn on your video, I'd love to see you. I think there was a question um, about the accelerator program. Yes, yes. I think Tim asked that. Yes. So that is, uh, uh, do you want to respond to that, Dara? Um, or I can share. So it's, it's our, it, so that's with uh, JP Morgan Chase. Fluent is doing an analysis of uh, accelerators and cohort programs using their fluency score, uh, which is something that they're equating to kind of like a credit score for entrepreneurs. Um, and they're applying that to entrepreneurs as they enter into those uh, cohort-based pro programs and models. Jamie is the key point of contact there. I linked the, uh, uh, the website. They also have an online chat. So if you want to connect with someone right away, you can do that uh, through their website. Yeah, I think the other thing that's interesting about that particular project is thinking about um, the opportunity to widen the net for companies or, or entrepreneurs that are considered and uh, trying to kind of uh, eliminate any biases that may, um, you know, it be there um, and create a, a more inclusive, potentially more inclusive opportunity based on the outcomes. Okay. Any other questions, thoughts? We've got a couple of experts in this webinar who have done this. Catherine, Thomas, I'm looking at both of you. Um, you've been able to do this. You've been able to make your case and go after funding. Hey, Rob. Hi. Hi. What would you add? What are we missing? What's that? What are we missing? What would you add? No, no, I just want to ask you uh, and, and the experts um, this question. The, um, there was a, a summit in North Carolina the last couple of days, and one of the themes in terms of uh, bulking up the attractiveness of startups was this idea of, of what they called market value assets, which is where a hub like ours would work with a startup and they get some sort of credit or a certificate and that would help their credit score in, uh, in terms of getting funding. So I just wondered what you thought about that. Is there, and I think you just alluded to it a second ago. But what about this idea of uh, somehow layering on above, above what they, what they currently have is credit scores by getting assistance from PSOs. That is very interesting. Dr. Campbell, look like you were nodding there. Did you have a thought? <laughs> you know, I just reviewed a paper for a scholar um, that's gonna be coming out early 2021. And it was about, you know, different ways to finance wealth building, um, supporting entrepreneurial work, um, and without getting into too much details of the paper, uh, the, the, one of the points was talking about layering, which is essentially combining different types of funding kind of into like a financial aid package for entrepreneurs. Um, so if, for those of you who've uh, attended college, you may recall, you know, you had a combination of 
grants and scholarships and work studies and things like that that was a part of your academic financial aid package. Um, layering in the sense for entrepreneurs would be combining CDBG grants with, for example, um, private sector loans, maybe um, some crowdfunded loans to a program like Kiva or WeFunder, and maybe some tax breaks or tax credits if uh, an entrepreneur is getting into a new space um, within the city or within a certain geographic uh, area of focus. And so that whole comprehensive mix of things are layered in to help the entrepreneur um, meet their goal. I think it's a fantastic idea. It requires this, this notion of systemsness um, to, to be articulated within a community in order for those different things to come together harmoniously. Cool. Okay. Um, so I support it. <laughs> I know uh, Kaufman has done some interesting things around market value assets um, in a little bit of a different context, more around workforce um, training, but it's interesting to, to think about that and how it could be layered for entrepreneurial uh, application. Okay, um, Kim had asked, can you share some lessons learned on the key roles for building your team? Um, I think I'm actually, Lomax, I'm gonna ask you to answer this one because, and I see you have members of your, of your quote unquote team that are actually on this call. Um, maybe you could talk a little bit about how you built your implementation team and brought partners to the table to really make the magic happen. Absolutely, and I can't take full credit for that work. Um, shout out to Sylvia and Irene who are in the Zoom room with us. Um, from Rochester's um, RIT Center for Urban Entrepreneurship and Volunteer Legal Services Project. I don't think I see anybody else here. Um, in essence, um, Rochester has a long history of collaboration because we came together around anti-poverty about 10 years ago. And a couple of years prior to me coming on at the city, um, the Q, RIT Center for Urban Entrepreneurship, was convening a monthly kind of roundtable meeting so that um, the organizations that supported entrepreneurs weren't operating in a duplicative fashion. And mm -hmm. so when I started, I started attending those meetings and, and learned that one of their ambitions was to launch an entrepreneur ecosystem. And so as we raised the funds to do this work, we said, well, it just makes sense that members of our project team should come from a broad mix of um, participants from this roundtable um, group. And then we should also invite members from our, our local economic development corporation to be at the table because on the front end, uh, for any coveyites out there, beginning with the end in mind, I want to think about how we sustain the effort going forward. And so where could it live? Understanding that um, political administrations change within municipal government so I did not want to try to embed it in city government long-term. And so either our EDC or an anchor partner like RIT uh, would be a more appropriate long-term place to, to, to hold this uh, subscription. And so that was kind of how we said who needs to be at the table. Um, also too, uh, I'm, a, I'm a formally trained project manager. So I use this, this communications channel formula that suggests that project teams should never be more than like seven people because the more people you have, the more opportunity for chaos and confusion. And so um, in essence, four people can, can have six different conversations um, and seven people, well actually um, eight people, for example, could have 18 different conversations, uh, 16 different conversations. And so you wanna keep it tight and you ask the question, who have the competencies, who has the bandwidth, who has the passion and who's positioned within the organization that can actually help carry the work. And that was kind of how we went about selecting who should sit at the, um, the, the core team um, for, the, you know, for implementing the platform and then later the leadership team for maintaining our efforts in Rochester. Excellent. Um, Rob, there's a question. Um, Don uh, Petrie, I believe, um, was curious about when we'll be able to share access so I would say within the next 48 hours, um, is that fair? It basically is on me to go ahead and <laughs> do all download and upload to YouTube. Yeah, well, and we will we'll also follow up um, with everybody that registered uh, yes. with the PowerPoint also. Andy had made a comment. I just want to make sure to highlight that we don't lose. Don Mackey, a uh, good friend, man, amazing work. 
uh, both with U2 and then also uh, Network Kansas, another amazing ent uh, organization. But um, Andy had linked to a, a white paper that Don had wrote about um, looking at uh, creating a, a donor advised fund and using that in rural communities as the primary application. Absolutely amazing uh, work that they're doing. Do check that out. Catherine, I love your point about relationships being key. Um, and I don't know if you're, if you're on, if you wanna just share a little bit about your comment here and, and that role of board members, I think sometimes we forget. <laughs> um, yeah, I just, I, to me, that was like a, a major breakthrough. We did have, uh, and I, I think tapping our board members uh, for their relationships. I mean, we don't ask our board uh, members to raise money, uh, but we do ask them to bring us connections and this connection of a board member connecting with a, a, a foundation board member setting up meetings and then gave us the foot in the door to present a concept paper really developed in this um, unbelievable relationship with the foundation who's funded us um, with three separate rounds of funding, uh, including one just to build our capacity, which is just astounding. Um, I then the same kind of thing happened, I, uh, and I haven't told you this Rob too, is that um, one of the cities in our region I did get some planning money from J.P. Morgan Chase, um, and they just had a little money, bit of money. And they were housers; they were community development housing, and they didn't know how to set up the micro enterprise component of it. So uh, I came in as a technical advisor, brought in some of the entrepreneur uh, resource partners, and uh, we just pushed a pilot uh, in this last bit of planning money, and then. Part of the Irvine money that I got, I used to fund the uh, regrant, and so it really established us as a good partner. And so when they go back to J.C. Morgan Chase with a really robust responses and outcomes from this project, they look like they might be going after some significant funding, which will include the micro enterprise component in their larger grant application, which we're feeling very optimistic about. So those partnership developments and being a technical advisor for community development collaboratives um, and providing the small business component of it. I think that was kind of a nice surprise, but um, uh, those are both collaborative approaches that I think were very helpful. Excellent. And I see Faye has shared uh, Forward Cities has a scorecard, the E3 scorecard. Uh, Forward Cities, love that organization, love Fay. I'm glad that, that they're on here. I definitely want to check that out. Um, and that might be another another tool in, in, your, in your tool belt as you're going after funding. Uh, Faye, I don't know if you want to jump in and just say a couple of uh, words on that. Uh, yeah, hi, everybody. Um, great to be on with you. Um, Rob, as always, great to see you. And this is fantastic. Um, you know, a lot of what, what you shared, you've shared and uh, is what we're hearing echoing around uh, the country in the, in the work that we're doing. I, I will say that this tool is something, you know, we've, um, we have been developing over the last couple of years based on our experiences. And, and exactly what you said is that it's very hard to get funders to, to commit to this work unless you have some sort of um, something you can measure to say, this is the growth that we're looking for. Um, what, what are your ultimate goals? What areas are you really trying to focus in on? And the scorecard's designed um, to really be able to give a, um, a broad-based uh, perspective um, from folks around the ecosystem. So the idea is to get as many people in your ecosystem in as many roles as possible from entrepreneurs to, to ESOs, to funders to take it, um, to have varying perspectives and a holistic score. Um, and hopefully, uh, we hope that eventually this will develop an, into an index um, for, for health and equity of an ecosystem that can be um, uh, compared, where communities can compare uh, where they're strong and where they're weak and where they might be able to, to lean in to um, put some funding in some specific areas in their ecosystem. Oh, I'm loving that. Very cool, very cool. And Pam, oh. I saw your comment um, and I just wanna make sure you have a, a second too to jump in. Pam, you are a funder. Uh, I would love for you to share a little bit more about that storytelling component. Yeah, so we not only seek funds, but we also have the opportunity to distribute funds. And so when it comes to what we call performance measures, uh, impact does not have to always have to be quantifiable. Um, it can be qualifiable. And storytelling is a, a great way to demonstrate impact. In fact, in our annual report this year, we did very little with numbers. We did everything with stories. 
And so the stories, you know, it takes time to do, but they're long lasting and they can provide opportunities for your organization to share those stories in a, in a variety of ways. And so that will also attract funders, especially private donors who might not really know what you do, but through the story, uh, they'll get what you do. Um, I would also say lessons learned. We really, you know, you might have the greatest plan and the greatest outcomes, but maybe not achieve what you had anticipated. So the unexpected outcomes and also the lessons learned have great value to us here as a funder. Yeah. No, that was meant to touch on my, my little pro tip area, but that is, you know, you start that relationship. It's not just before, but it's also during and after. And um, when things change, that's okay, but you need to let your funder know. And you need to work with your funder to figure out what does the trajectory of the remaining part of our project look like based on the new needs on the ground. And that is a welcome conversation for most of my founder friends. They would rather have that conversation there than at the end when the term is expiring and you're, you're trying to go for re renewal funding or to uh, check out a different opportunity. Um, th that, that process doesn't end once you get the money. <laughs> right, Lomax, you know. Yeah. I think he uh, had to hop yeah, off. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it we doesn't... are at the top of the hour, Rob. So, okay. um, I mean, we can hang on for a few more minutes, but uh, we'll I think. We're... Goodbye. <laughs> so many wonderful people on the call today. I suppose we probably should. Yeah. Uh... <laughs> Thank you for all the examples uh, for those of the, you that um, dropped in links and comments into the chat um, and um, hoping that there'll be some ongoing conversations uh, where you can continue to learn from each other. All right. Thank you all.